The majority of people in Europe in the Middle Ages lived as farmers in small villages, growing crops like wheat and barley on land rented to them by the landowner. These rents would often be paid as a percentage of the crop yield from the field, the remainder being used to feed the peasants working the land, as well as the smaller urban population at the time. As well as growing crops, many people also owned a variety of cattle, goats and pigs for milk, as well as horses and oxen for use as plough animals. Largely in the north of England, where the lay of the land made arable farming more difficult, sheep were grazed on the hillsides and rockier areas where crops couldn't grow. The wool and cloth trades became more lucrative during the late Middle Ages, and increasingly so during the years of relative peace when Henry VII's economic and mercantile policies boosted trade. Most wool and cloth merchants transported their goods to the markets of Flanders. Um, sorry, excuse me, sorry, hold on, stop the, stop the tape. What? Why did you stop the tape? Flanders isn't in the Netherlands, sir. What? Since when? Since 1830, it now belongs to Belgium, sir. Belgium? Flemish mercantile centres such as Brugge, Antwerp and Ypres saw millions of wool sacks pass through their gates each year, much of it grown on English sheep. Because the cloth trade was such a lucrative business, many landowners decided to convert their arable land into pastoral land for the rearing of sheep. However, the ambitions of the nobility clashed with that of the peasantry, who grazed their animals on the common land now being seized for private sheep rearing. The idea of a communal pasture where the commoners of the parish could graze their animals was promised as part of the Lammas Rites, whereby one could use this pasture or village green between Lammas Day and August until April. In short, there was not enough grass to go around for feeding both the landowner's sheep and the animals of all the commoners, so the process of enclosing the common land with fences began to stop the peasants from entering the area. However, this would have severe consequences for society in the long run. Let's take a look at a typical medieval village. The settlement is built up around the manor house where the landowner lives. He rents the houses and strips of lands to the tenants so long as they pay him part of their yield. In reality, the situation was far more complex than shown here. For example, most villages would have a church who would demand tax in the form of the tithe and may even own large parts of the field system around the village. Now I've used very simple icons here because I just want to make it rather easy to follow along so I can make my point understandable. Now let's say 10 fields are producing wheat and another is being used to rear sheep on the rockier terrain as well as two others that are fallow, meaning no crops are being grown there this season to allow the soil to rejuvenate because the system used was the crop rotation system which was used all over Europe at this time. Now following this setup the village of say a hundred villagers would produce wheat from 10 fields which given that the harvest was a good one would result in a surplus so that some of it could be sold to other areas of the country such as cities where they obviously don't grow food themselves. Now the population of England in 1524 was around 2.3 million and although not everyone in Tudor England was a farmer, the vast majority of people did work the land. And so I've calculated that if there were 100 people in every village, and every village produced 10 units of wheat, there would be a total of 230,000 units of wheat produced in England. Now this is an incredibly simplified calculation that hasn't taken any factors such as the disparity in village size, bad harvests, regional differences, consumption and the existence of non-farmers into consideration. But as a simple formula it's useful for understanding the impact and the effect of enclosure. It's also important to remember that at this point in time, over a decade into Henry VIII's reign, enclosing was being done but on a small scale. Now let's say the previous landowner who never really enclosed much land, only using the unarable ground for pastoral sheep rearing, has recently died, and his son has taken over, and he decides he needs to get his manor's finances in order. 
Now, he has his men enclose a large area of his land where the common folk used to grow wheat and graze their animals. Now, suddenly, the whole dynamic of the equation changes. Now, there are only three fields producing wheat, yet there are still a hundred villages to feed. And on a national scale, with a huge population increase between 1524 and 1550 to 2.9 million people, the subsequent result of 87,000 units of wheat being produced is bound to cause serious problems for the nation. The most direct consequence was the displacement of the local people, who were no longer needed by their landowners as pastoral farming, unlike the labour-intensive arable farming, needed only a few shepherds to tend the flock. And in a tragic twist often repeated in history, hundreds of people were cleared off their land to make way for hundreds of sheep just because they were more profitable. And in the slightly longer term, you've got famine and food shortages becoming a real problem as fewer fields were producing less wheat for more people. Now, there were also other factors attached to the enclosement of common land. For instance, if the white section symbolising the fields used for wool production were making 10 units of monetary income, and the rent garnered from the common folk who worked the green fields made 3 units of monetary income, the new landowner isn't exploiting his land to the full potential. Now, one consequence of this is the rising of the tenant's rent, which increased at a drastic rate as fewer people were working, the remaining arable land meant less people were paying rent. And at the same time, you've got the produce from the sheep's wool increasing in price. So many landowners during Edward VI's reign enclosed even larger areas to increase their profits. However, I don't think we should be too quick to lay the entirety of the blame on the greed of the landowners, as during this period the Regent of England, the Duke of Somerset, who was standing in for the infant son of Henry VIII, Edward VI, had created an economic conundrum in the country. Upon Henry's death in 1547, he'd invaded Scotland in an attempt to spread the new Protestant faith of the English into Scotland, which started well enough with an outright massacre of the Scots army at Pinky Clove. However, the old alliance between Scotland and France was sealed when Mary Queen of Scots married the Dauphin Francis, and soon French troops were fighting the English and threatening the south coast. Unwilling to leave the new conquered land to the Scottish, Somerset retained a huge garrison in Scotland, which also left a huge dent in the English treasury. Somerset ordered the currency to be debased, which in turn led to the inflation and the worsening of the economic situation. Somerset was often seen as being a good duke, because he promised the common people to do something about the problem of enclosures, although in reality he simply took half of the profits made from them and did little else to aid those suffering from their effects. When the authorities failed to put a stop to the process of enclosing, rioting broke out in the countryside, and many of the common folk started setting fire to the fences and illegally grazing their animals on the land the landowners had set aside for sheep rearing. The situation reached boiling point in the summer of 1549, when an armed rebellion broke out in the Norfolk town of Wyndham. Although himself a landowner and an encloser, the rebellion was named after Robert Kett, who instead of fighting against the rebels who came to destroy his fences, joined them and became their leader. At its height, 16,000 men from local villages marched on and stormed the city of Norwich, although it was soon put down by the Earl of Warwick, who had Kett executed in London Tower. Alright everyone, thank you very much for watching. So I thought this was an interesting topic to make a video about, because it's not really something that I've covered too much on the channel, sort of agricultural history, but it is very important, and enclosures doesn't just stop here. I sort of hinted at in the video that this kind of thing has happened a lot, so for example the highland and lowland clearances you see this happening. Um, and it goes on into the 17th century as well, although this obviously was just Tudor and medieval enclosures. Alright everyone, so thank you very much for watching. If you're new, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you know when I upload. And please leave a like if you enjoyed it, as well as a comment if you have any further questions. Then I'm on Facebook, you can send me a YouTube message, which I'm finally getting back to answering on. And of course, you can leave a comment in the comment section below. Alright everyone, I'm History with Hilbert, and thank you very much for watching. Is it